Hello, I am HIST Conference. This is Eric Hoyt. Uh, I'm an Assistant Professor of Communication Arts broadcasting to you today um, from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, I'm sorry I can't be there with you in person right now, but I'm really glad to be able to virtually participate in this conference um, and for this video to be included as, as part of it. The title of my talk, my video, is Project Arclight, or How to data mine the 1.5 million pages of the Media History Digital Library. Um, so uh, I'm going to tell you about it, um, and really sort of in two parts. First, I'll tell you about uh, the collection, um, the Media History Digital Library's collection that I know a lot of you are familiar with. But then we'll, we'll get to move into this new data mining initiative, um, Project Arclight, and really what you can do with it. Um, and I'm going to be able to, to hand things over to my associate, Tony Tran, um, who'll be able to guide you through this data mining software that, that we've been developing for Arclight. So um, to start though, before you can do any of this kind of data mining, text analytics kind of work that I'll be telling you about, you, you need a collection of texts to work with. And um, we're, we're grateful to have a really wonderful one um, that we've been working with in, on this project. And that's from the, the Media History Digital Library. Um, full disclaimer, I also co-direct the MHDL David Pierce founded and directed it. Um, and our, our collection now, which includes lots of fan magazines like Photoplay and Motion Picture Magazine, lots of trade papers, Variety, Film Daily, um, TV trade papers too, like Sponsor, um, Broadcasting Magazine, lots and lots of great stuff. This was produced um, through collaboration. These things don't just scan themselves. Um, and we've been really grateful to be able to work with organizations, institutions like the Library of Congress Packard Campus, um, digitizing just a ton of these really rare um, and important magazines, trade publications. Domator, um, the, the Society for Early Cinema Studies, also supported our scanning. Um, Moving Picture World um, from 1908 up through 1920 is, is on our site, 1919, I think because of um, Domator, and you, uh, I am Hist, that's right. Um, the Media History Digital Library uh, was the recipient of the 2013 um, Michael Nelson Prize. We were very grateful to get that award. It came with uh, a $500 prize amount, and we spent it on scanning. So you will see um, on our site now, um, mediahistoryproject.org, uh, some of the variety. Um, like probably about four or five years worth, we were able to pay for thanks to that award. So, so thank you. This is how it's done. And through enough of these collaborations, we've been able to, to put together, I think, a really important um, and impressive collection. So we're getting close to 1.6 million pages. My guess is by um, next year, we'll be up to 2 million, maybe the year after 3 million. And that, that gives us a lot to work with. So what do you do with all that material? You know, you can try to read it in a linear way. Uh, and move through it using um, the book reader, sort of the, the magazine experience, but on the web. You can also search it using our search engine, Lantern, um, which you can check out for yourself, lantern.mediahist.org. Um, and Lantern gives you, you know, this, the capability of running uh, full text keyword searches across the entire collection. So, um, you know, here, for example, is a search of Anime Wong, right? You run the query, and boom, um, over 2,000 hits related to Anime Wong. And now you, know, you can scroll through them. You can also, and, and this part I really like, click through, download the page, but also um, jump right into the magazine and get to, if not the very page itself that matches, within one or two pages um, so that you have a, a good sense of the context. You know, one of the, I don't know if it's a downside of full text search, but it's something you just have to contend, contend with is that the, the nature of search, it does kind of remove us from the context, right? We are constantly just sort of dipping in and out of things. There's another sort of potential risk of, of doing research in this full text search kind of way. And that is, as um, Ted Underwood has written about, there's a, there's a confirmation bias that, that often goes along with this research method. In other words, we have a hypothesis, right? Anime Wong meant this to American culture or in the film industry at this time. And we do, you know, a search, and there's 2,000 hits. But we don't look at all those 2,000 hits. You know, we kind of wind up cherry-picking the piece of evidence that, that supports that thesis that we originally had. 
Now, hopefully, as good researchers, we also stay attuned to the, um, you know, the, the evidence that does not support our thesis, um, that contradicts it or you know, takes it in another direction. But still, um, I think full text search on the whole always has that possibility of confirmation bias as part of it. So that was part of the inspiration for this new initiative I'll, I'll tell you about now, Project Arclight, um, where we got to thinking about how could we try to sort of embrace the scale of search, um, but push it in a data mining direction that, that brings some of that, that context back into it. Um, and we were also just inspired, frankly, by Twitter analytics. Um, so if you're a, a Twitter user, or even if you're not, you may have seen some of the studies that are out there where um, researchers have tracked how media is being discussed on Twitter, how um, the, the, the new Entourage movie that just opened, as I'm recording this, for instance, how it's being discussed in different communities, how they're, how they're talking about the figures that involve, the people involved, and that particular media text. And so we got to thinking, what if we did that for film and media history? What if we thought of all these publications as being kind of a, a giant Twitter stream, and could we look for the patterns? That was our idea. We were excited about it, um, pulling it off takes a lot of collaboration, a lot of support, and we are very grateful to have received a Digging Into Data grant um, that uh, our team here at the University of Wisconsin-Madison applied for in coordination with uh, Charles Ackland and his team at Concordia University in Montreal. So our two teams applied together, and we were the recipient of one of these grants, um, and our work has been supported by um, SSHRC in Canada, um, and by the IMLS, Institute for Museum and Library Services here in the U.S. We've also gotten support from Concordia University and the Graduate School here at UW-Madison. Um, and what that funding has, has enabled is a couple of things. Um, it's enabled us to, to physically get together, and in fact, the, um, we held a symposium in Montreal just last month. Um, it was a great chance to, to bring, to people, bring together people working on this project, but also um, folks from different fields. So we had um, digital humanities scholars working closely with film and media historians, along with um, critics of new media and big data. Uh, and really interesting, productive uh, things came from that. So in part, we think of Arclight as being a, a community for this kind of research. But it's also an app. Um, we wanted to build a software tool that could do this kind of analysis I was describing. And so to tell you more about this software tool, I'm happy to hand things off to my colleague, Tony Tran. Tony, take it away. Thanks, Eric. I'm on the Project ArcLight team here at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And let me tell you more about our project. Project ArcLight is currently developing a web-based tool that will allow users to quickly search and visualize how entities trend across time within the Media History Digital Library's corpus of 1.6 million pages. With a simple user interface, the user can easily search for an entity and the ArcLight app will produce a visualization by recording the number of search hits per year. For the example of Anime Wong, we can quickly see how Wong trended within these periodicals over time, including when she began to appear in the corpus, years that she peaked, and when her name began to disappear. Furthermore, the app has the ability to search multiple entities at the same time, allowing us to produce more comparative views of media history. For example, I want to see how another Asian American actor like Philip Ahn compares to Wong. With a simple search, I can see how their trending patterns overlapped and raise possible questions about the reasons when they do intersect and when they do not. While this example only has two entities, the ArcLight app is capable of searching for thousands of entities at the same time. In addition to the graphs, the data produced by searches can be downloadable in the forms of CSVs. Soon, we will be able to provide the user with more information within the interface, such as specific dates, the type of periodicals, as well as links to Lantern that allow users to seamlessly flow between distant and close reading. While the app produces data and visualizations at amazingly fast speed, we also wanted to make sure we accompany these results with an interpretive framework that helps us remain critical as we search. For this, we offered Scaled Entity Search, or SES, as a method to help better understand and contextualize our searches and results. It focuses on three key elements that shape the processes of the ArcLight app, the entities, the corpus, and the digital. SES is a triangulated interpretive framework that is critically aware of these elements and the relationship between them. 
For the entities, SCS asks users to reflect on how their entity list was developed and formed. Why did you select or omit these specific terms? What sources did you use to generate this list? And how do these factors limit or enhance the possibilities? As we know, what we search for and do not search for plays a huge role in our results. We also need to reflect on our corpus. What is the size and scope of the corpus? Who created it and why? What are its strengths and weaknesses when it comes to time periods and diversity of publications? In other words, where are the silences in the corpus that we must consider? Lastly, we must understand how the digital comes into play. What schemas, fields, and other metadata categories are being used? What do we lose and gain when historical materials and experiences are processed digitally? And how does making materials machine readable influence our research process? In asking these questions about these three elements, we must also understand how they relate to each other. How does the entity list work with the corpus? How does the corpus change when it becomes digital? And how does this process interact with our entity list? For our corpus, the Media History Digital Library, which is focused on periodicals related to 20th century American media, it might be limiting to search with the list of botany terms. However, we shouldn't always see weaknesses as a bad thing, and playing to one's strength can limit our ability to ask new and surprising questions. Since our corpus is heavily focused on U.S. media, a list of foreign films may have low results. But with Arclight, we can see which and when foreign films or filmmakers begin showing up in our corpus, and begin formulating new questions of why certain entities are showing up in a corpus that is not geared toward that list. As historians, we are aware that time is important and understanding the time scope of a corpus in relation to the entity list is key in analyzing our results. Instead of just assuming a certain actor lost popularity in the 1940s, we should also consider that many of the fan magazines in the Media History Digital Library corpus only go up to the 1940s. This can be due to several reasons, copyright, budget restrictions, access, or availability, all of which affect the relationship between the corpus and the digital. The condition of the material item is also important, Font type, speckled microfilm, and normal wear and tear can heavily influence the quality of the optical character recognition software and obscure results and produce false positives. We must also think about how our entity list can produce false positives through the digital search. For example, the search for the film company, Universal, will have hits beyond the film company. In critically thinking about these elements and their relationship to each other, SES provides users and researchers multiple ways to interpret and contextualize their Arclight app results as well as a way to develop new questions about media history. We're back. Tony, that was great. Thank Wasn't you. that nice? Tony Tran, everyone. Um, and one thing I really liked about that demo that you just showed was the way that you stressed the importance of interpretation. That it's not just about you know this all-powerful software app or tool that will we'll never have that tool that does everything for us because a really huge important part of this process is the interpretive side and thinking about why you know a particular entity is, is trending compared to another one what's going on in these magazines what are the the nature of them why are they focusing on, on certain people so a uh, question that i'm sure folks out there are wondering about too right now uh, when will they be able to use this for themselves they just saw the the, the software demo when is it going to be online well we're projecting around a uh, a rollout of the end of summer, uh, around August or September of 2015. So hopefully that'll be out soon and you guys can get your hands on it um, and put in your, in, uh, your, your own inquiries and then uh, hopefully raise some new questions and new directions of research. Yeah, well, I'm really excited to see what um, folks do with it. Um, so thank you, please be on the lookout for it. And um, Tony, I guess you and I better get back to actually doing this software thing. Yeah. Okay, thank back you. to work, see ya.